Okay, next one up. Uh, I'm so delighted uh, to have you here. Thank you so, so much for coming last minute. Um, uh, you were nominated by um, Alex Glassin from the Human Rights Foundation. And uh, once he sent me a link to your work, I was just like, oh my God, this is happening. And you guys are doing really real work to improve, to improve the life of uh, folks really like right out in the real world, especially of one person or uh, at least his legacy. So thank, thank you, you so much for the work that you're doing and I'm excited to hear more about it. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's an honor for me to speak to such a sophisticated audience and uh, I'm very nervous about that. Um, so my topic and my presentation is very different from everything that you've seen here today. Um, and it barely fits the topic of uh, optimistic view on the future, but I'll try my best to be optimistic. Um, so I'm gonna speak about Bitcoin and human rights. And usually when I say the word Bitcoin, first thing that people think about is Bitcoin as a store of value or Bitcoin as a new technology, or Bitcoin as money for criminals. But very rarely people think about Bitcoin as a tool for freedom and democracy and about its value for many freedom fighters all over the world. Um, many authoritarian regimes today use the banking system as a tool of oppression against uh, freedom fighters. They freeze their bank accounts, they deny them of uh, access to banking services, they shut down their um, crowdfunding campaigns. And by doing that, they uh, completely destroy the ability of freedom fighters to continue their, um, doing their work. And this happens everywhere in the world. Um, China, Russia, Belarus, Venezuela, and many authoritarian regimes do that against freedom fighters. And I could tell you hundreds of mind-blowing stories about activists that I personally know who actually use Bitcoin in their work because they are deprived of access to traditional currencies. But unfortunately, I don't have time to do that. And I'm gonna tell you one particular story, the story of my own. Uh, so my name is Anna Chukhovich, and for seven years I have been working as a CFO of the Anti-Corruption Foundation, the leading opposition power of Russia. The foundation that was created by the leader of Russian opposition, Alexei Navalny, back in 2011 in Moscow. Uh, so when Alexei Navalny announced his participation in the presidential elections in 2016, we began our crowdfunding campaign and we started collecting donations not only in rubles, but also in Bitcoin, because already at the time it was clear for us that it wasn't safe to collect donations only in rubles because Russian banking system is fully transparent and fully controlled by the government. And little did we know that it was the right decision for us to start using Bitcoin. One day in 2019, I was sitting at my working desk in Moscow doing my usual financial duties, such as making some payments, counting salaries and taxes and so on. And at one moment I refreshed the page of our online bank, and this is the screenshot from that moment. This is what I found there, the negative balance of almost minus one trillion rubles, which was approximately minus 13 billion euros at that moment. As a financial director, I almost had a heart attack. I, I was screaming out loud. And of course, I immediately called the bank to clarify the situation, but they simply refused to provide me any explanation why they blocked our bank account. They just told me that your bank account is under arrest. And this type of situation occurred to us many times. First, they blocked the bank accounts of all of our legal entities, and then they began debanking our employees individually by uh, arresting all of their bank accounts. And they even arrested the bank account of Alexei Navalny himself and his family members. One of my colleagues went so far as to dig a hole in her backyard in the ground and she stashed her savings there, her cash, uh, because it was no longer safe to keep her money on the bank account. It can any moment be arrested and it wasn't safe to keep money in cash at home because there were occasional police raids and every time when police comes to our houses, they just confiscate all the cash they find. And eventually people were scared to receive any money from us because it would put their bank accounts at risk of being blocked. Um, it was hard for us to find anyone willing to provide any services for us. It was hard to find a contractor willing to rent out an office space. It was hard to find someone willing to print out some anti-Putin posters. Or when we were ar arranging the protest rally, no one wanted to give us a stage, speakers, microphones, just because no one wanted to accept payments from us. Um, that is why we, we, every time when we were facing such struggles, we could use Bitcoin in order to continue operating. 
But as many of you are aware, in 2020, Alexei Navalny was poisoned and he nearly died. And after receiving his treatment here in Germany, he decided to go back to Russia to continue his fight. But as soon as he entered the country, he was arrested. And after being tortured for three years in Russian prison, he was murdered. The Anti-Corruption Foundation in 2021 was labeled as an extremist organization and we were forced to leave the country. Now we are based in Lithuania where we continue our opposition work. But even based in Europe today, we use Bitcoin in our work on a daily basis and we actually rely on it more than we used to do before. The Anti-Corruption Foundation is a non-profit organization and we completely rely on donations. And, uh, since Putin decided to invade Ukraine, Russia is facing financial sanctions and it's not possible to send money from Russia abroad and it's not possible to send money from Europe to Russia. That is why we encourage our Russian donors to support us with Bitcoin. And this is the screenshot, the screenshot from our website. And at first we were thinking what we're gonna do with all these Bitcoin donations we receive from our Russian supporters. But very quickly we realized that there are so many payments that we need to make where Traditional currencies simply don't work. We need to send money to Russia to support political prisoners and their family members. We need to send money to Russia to support political activists who keep fighting against the regime and we cover their advocates. And now even uh, when investigating Navalny's murder, we encourage people to donate Bitcoin to us because we should pay uh, to those who help us investigate it inside Russia. And when Alexei Navalny was murdered, we had to pay for his funeral services in Moscow and we d did that with Bitcoin. Uh, this is our uh, Anti-Corruption Foundation team. Today we are a big organization of 140 people and 70 people, 50% of the organization receive salaries in Bitcoin for different reasons. And this is just the story of one organization, but there are so many, not only from Russia, but from all over the world, freedom fighters, activists, nonprofit organizations, free media, journalists, those who fight against their regimes inside their countries or working in exile, uh, those who are facing uh, financial repressions from their governments, those who cannot reach their countries financially, who are deprived of access to uh, their financial systems, they all need to find a currency that they can operate with. And uh, uh, that is why when I, I realized that uh, high demand from activists from all over the world, uh, half a year ago I decided to join the Human Rights Foundation where I wo work as a non-profit Bitcoin adoption lead, which means that I actually educate freedom fighters and non-profit organizations how to incorporate Bitcoin in their work and continue doing their fight. And uh, at the Human Rights Foundation, we uh, started our quarterly webinar, Bitcoin 101, for activists and um, non-profit organizations, and we teach them how to um, incorporate Bitcoin and how to uh, continue working. So uh, at the Human Rights Foundation, we believe that financial freedom is one of uh, important human uh, rights, and uh, we are very optimistic that Bitcoin can contribute to the fight against global dictatorships, against um, authoritarian regimes, and at the Human Rights Foundation we provide grants to uh, open source uh, development projects who contribute to, um, to the fight against global evil. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please. Canada performed a move that was later deemed unconstitutional by our courts, which was to freeze the assets of a series of loud protesters, um, including, their, including Bitcoin assets. Um, and so I, as the West is not immune to uh, political polarization of levels, right? As someone who's worked in this space, I'm probably one of the toughest places on earth to work in this space. Uh, what, which, what advice could you give to people who would want to set up networks of mutual aid uh, to sustain themselves as uh, we move forward? Um, those who want to learn more, I actually encourage everyone to enroll to our webinar and the next one starts on Monday, so if you want to learn more, uh, you can learn more. Um, yes, uh, it's a very complicated topic and there are tools uh, because really uh, Western governments try to regulate Bitcoin the same way they regulate traditional currencies and it's really hard if you are not aware what tools you can use in order to avoid those strict regulations. Um, 
I, like it's all uh, the question about uh, education, and um, if you want, uh, you, if you want to learn more how to do that, you can reach out to me. I will tell you more because it's a long topic. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it's not that easy. Even if you want to use Bitcoin, it's not e that easy, especially if you operate in Europe. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you.